And we got to get over this thing about not wanting to be in the world. I know we're in the world. We're not of the world. But we are in the world. And we got to quit being afraid of something in the world getting on us. Come on, we've had it backwards. <laughs> Everywhere we go, we ought to be praying something in us gets on them. Come on, that's the right kingdom perspective. But in order to do this, we've got to start grabbing a hold of this prophetic mantle in a whole new way. I'm telling you, God's getting ready to blow your minds. So let's talk about this prophetic mantle, this mantle of breakthrough that is being married to revival, okay? I'm going to give you three things that it's going to do for you, okay? Just so that you can be in a position of expectancy. Number one, the prophetic anointing on your life is going to give you the ability to see open, to see open hearts. When Jesus met the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and he started having a chat with her. It was a prophetic word that unlocked her heart. Remember, she started arguing religion with him, and Jesus said, well, let me just tell you this. Where's your husband? <laughs> and she said, well, I don't have a husband. He said, you've said right that you don't have a husband because you've had five husbands, and the guy that you're with now is not your husband. And she said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> but what did it do? It unlocked her. See, the pr prophetic becomes a key that unlocks the hardest heart. How many have been praying for family members, co-workers, friends, loved ones? I'm telling you, God's got a prophetic word for you that's going to unlock their hearts. Our job in the prophetic, our job in revival is to make Jesus real. And we carry that ability and we carry that anointing everywhere we go. I have so many stories of this, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'm going to tell you a couple, okay? I'll tell you a couple about how it unlocks a heart. I was on an airplane one time. And, um, you know, most of the time I'm talking to people that look like you. So my evangelism often happens on airplanes or in grocery stores. Okay, and when I'm seated next to somebody um, and we strike up a conversation, they'll invariably ask me, well, are you traveling on business or pleasure? I don't ever know how to answer that because my business is pleasure. I do love what I do. But or they'll say, well, what do you do for a living? And I have different ways that I answer that that can kind of steer the conversation I could say, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. And they'd say, oh, a woman pastor. Oh, that's, you know, we have that whole conversation. <laughs> or I can say, I'm a prophet, and they'll get up and change seats. <laughs> now, I've never actually done this, but one time, I'm going to do this. I'd like to just say, well, I'm an exorcist. Because I do cast out devils. I mean, that's part of my job. That's part of your job too, by the way. I just like to do it sometimes just to see what reaction I get, okay? Sometimes I say, oh, I help people understand their dreams. I could be sitting next to an atheist and they'll say, oh, really? Well, I had this dream. And God will prof prophetically open up their life to me. See, it's a tool to open up hearts. But I'll tell you about one time that I was not too interested in talking to the person next to me. I'd just gotten done with a very long uh, conference in Buffalo, New York. I was exhausted. I got on the plane. I had bumped up to first class. I had an empty seat next to me. Thank you, Jesus. I wasn't going to have to talk to anybody. I like to talk to people, but when you're tired, you're tired, right? And at the very last minute, this drunk man stumbles onto the plane, loud, drunk, smelling of alcohol, and he sits down, you guessed it, right next to me. 
And so they buttoned up the doors of the plane. We're getting ready to take off. And um, the guy is like, the guy is just like going on and on. He's chatting me up. I pick up a magazine. I'm giving him monosyllable answers. Yes, no. Hoping he's going to get the idea. I don't really want to talk to him. And then he reaches over and he starts touching my leg. Okay, I wanted to knock his head off, okay? And I heard the Holy Spirit sneak up in me. Does he ever do that? Jehovah's sneaky, right? He he snuck up in me and he said, put your magazine down and talk to the man. And I wanted to go, la, 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 I don't hear you, Lord. But I'm a prophet, and that's dangerous ground, okay? So I was like, okay. So I put my magazine down, and I turned to the gentleman, and he said, so tell me, what do you do for a living? And I just gave him a basic answer. I said, well, I'm a minister. And he says, a minister? A minister? Well, you... And he starts cussing me out at the top of his lungs. We're taxiing down the runway right now, okay? The whole plane hears it. The flight attendant's buckled in. She's going, sir, sir, you've got to be quiet. He is screaming. He is yelling at me. And I'm sitting there going, God, you told me to talk to him. (laughs) And so real quickly, I had to understand something real quick. This was not about me. And so while he's cussing at me, I dropped down in my spirit and I said, God, show me what I need to know. Come on, do you know we can do that? Not just because I'm a prophet, but because we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And we have access to the Holy Spirit at all times. So the Lord quickly gave me two, two words of knowledge. And the man is huffing and puffing, red in the face, angry at me. And I just said... I just want to thank you for sharing your heart. I mean, I didn't know how to transition into a word of knowledge. And so I said, I just want to thank you for sharing your heart. I said, you know, as you were sharing with me, I said, I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you he's so sorry about what happened to you when you were a boy and that minister abused you. And the man's mouth dropped open. And I said, and the Lord also showed me that you've lost one of your children to a cult. And you don't even know where they are, but the Lord says, your child is fine, I'm gonna bring him home. Let me just say this, what did I have to lose? Come on. What do we have to lose, right? Oh, well, I could be wrong. Well, you could be right. He already didn't like me. So this man that was cussing me out, all of a sudden, he starts weeping into his hands, just sobbing and weeping. And he said, how could you know those things about me? I said, I didn't. I said, but God does know you and God loves you. And he said to me, there is no God that I know that would love me. And I said, well, that's because you don't know the right God. And he turns to me, suddenly sober, and he says, well, we've got two hours. Why don't you tell me about him? Come on. <laughs> 